Yeah. Uh, we're going to get started. So it's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Jason Londo um, for the Virginia Tech Life Science Seminar. Um, Jason Londo is an associate professor in the School of Integrative Plant Science in the horticulture section at Cornell University. Prior to joining the horticulture section in 2022, he was a research geneticist with the UA USDA ARS Greek Genetic, also located at Cornell Agritech in Geneva, New York. Um, and he was at this position for 10 years. Jason received his bachelor's degree from Florida Institute of Technology and his PhD from Washington University in St. Louis. Um, and I have a strong interest in Jason's research, which is why I've invited him here. Um, because he does a lot of work understanding the interaction between climate stresses and genetic diversity, specifically in fruit crops, with the goal to improve our understanding of how fruit crops can adapt, adapt to climate change induced environmental stress. Um, so given his location in New York, it's no surprise that he works a lot on apples and grapevine um, and looking at how temperature, water avail availability and soil chemistry impact these fruit crops and their physiological performance, as well as looking at genetic components of these responses. Um, so it's my pleasure to let Jason take the floor and today he's going to be talking about winter physiology in a warmer world, cold hardiness and dormancy interactions in grapevines. So that's welcome. That's Courtney. Thanks everybody for coming too. I appreciate it. And I appreciate the invite um, from GTFSS. PTLS. Uh, PTLS. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, we're going to get started here. And I just wanted to do a, a, this is a little bit of an expansion on the introduction that ju that was just provided. Um, I operate the Fruit Physiology and Crop Adaptation Research Group at Cornell Agritech. So we're the extension campus in Geneva, New York. Uh, it's about an hour north of Ithaca. So most people affiliate um, Cornell with Ithaca. Um, so we're like the lower key group of Cornellians. Uh, this is my lab group. So I'm pictured there on the top left corner. My lab manager and, and uh, lead technician, Hannah, and then I have two students who work in grape, Hongrei and, and Faith. Hongrei just finished last week and Faith just started. And then I have two students in Apple, Kenneth and Davis on the bottom left. And then Phil is a seasonal technician and Sophie's a high school intern. So we don't have undergrads at Agritech, but we do have a good connection with uh, the local high school. And so the objectives of my group are to measure the phenotypic plasticity or the resilience uh, of what we grow in New York in grapes and apples. We're trying to determine the key genes and pathways that optimize fruit production and that can vary from season to season. We then want to be able to build prediction models so that we can uh, do site selection or cultivar selection in the current climate, but with an eye towards long-term climate stability. And then I have a 60-40 split between research and extension. And so 40% of my program is a direct to grower interaction. And so we do reciprocal uh, knowledge sharing. So a lot of my projects, while we're going to be talking about a lot of basic um, science today, a lot of that is with the uh, the tune towards providing solutions to growers. So the main character uh, for the talk is Vitus vinifera, the European grape. This is the, uh, across the whole globe, um, there's a couple different species that get cultivated, but Vitus vinifera is probably 99% of uh, species makeup. And we grow grapes for a lot of different end products. So of course, everybody is familiar with wine, table grapes, raisins, and juice grapes. Uh, it's the most economically important berry crop worldwide. And it was domesticated in Europe uh, from its presumed ancestor, uh, Vitus vinifera uh, sylvestris. And pictured there is a, it's, sometimes it's kind of hard to see with the gray and the white, but the gray area is the presumed natural range of that wild species, which is all around the Mediterranean basin. And I highlight this because the winter temperatures in that region are pretty light. So if you're looking at the gray overlap with the colored uh, map here, you can see much of the ancestral range in the winter minimum temperatures is a very mild climate, not a lot of freezing stress in the Mediterranean. And this crop is adapted to a Mediterranean climate. It has It is grown primarily in Mediterranean climates, although in New York, you'll see we push that a little bit. Uh, that's defined by cool, mild winters and warm, dry summers. And despite the fact that the ancestral range doesn't have a lot of freeze stress, the crop itself is quite adapted to survive uh, low temperatures. So Vitus vinifera, depending on the cultivar that you're talking about, and when I say cultivar, I mean like Chardonnay or Merlot or Cabernet Sauvignon, those are all cultivars. 
Depending on the cultivar, they can survive winter temperatures that range down to around negative 18 to negative 25 degrees Celsius or negative 10 to negative 13 Fahrenheit. Uh, as you'll see in New York, we go colder than that. And what we rely on in order to grow grapes in that region is hybridization with wild species. And grape breeding has a long history of using wild species to bring in traits that uh, enhance its resilience. And for the most part, it's been used in rootstock breeding uh, to make vines more amenable to soil chemistry differences or root pathogens. But we also use wild species in breeding to bring in disease resistance for the canopy as well as climate resistance. And so uh, wild vitus, depending on the wild vice you're talking about, they can survive winters down to around negative 35 to negative 40 C. And negative 40 C and negative 40 F is the same temperature. So very, very cold. Um, these wild, wild species can sometimes survive to those those levels. And so picture on the left are some fruit uh, aspects of those wild species. They tend to be very tiny, very poorly flavored fruit, but they have a lot of good climate adaptation traits. Pictured on the right are a couple of range maps for four different species, Vitus estivalis, Labrusca, Cenaria, and Riparia. And you can see the lime green is the county distribution over the state distribution, which is in dark green. And so you can kind of see the, the range of climates that wild grapes exist in. You can see in Virginia, for example, has all four of these. Um, and so we depend on these wild varieties and these wild traits in order to adapt our vines to future climate change. We care about cold hardiness, particularly in New York, because temperature is the, is the defining abiotic stress that limits how far we can push the vines. So picture on the right is a, another winter temperature map, like I showed of Europe. And that black swooshy line is the latitude line that runs through uh, Geneva. And that's the same latitude line that runs through France and Italy. And so it, it's often sometimes hard to picture that the Mediterranean is as far north as uh, New York is, but it has a very different temperature climate. So we have the same latitude, but much colder climate. Our industry is the third largest in the United States. California and Washington are one and two. Depending on the metrics you use, it's up to $15 billion in economic impact. And when we have a really bad winter, you can suffer up to about $15 million in impact, but that's direct to the producers. That's not the end product chain. So it hits the people who make the least money off of the system. And so it's a big, a big threat. And one of the questions we have is whether or not warming climate reduces this threat in our region. And I'll show you why that's a little bit true and a little bit not true. <clears throat> in New York, we have four recognized AVAs. Uh, those are official viticultural regions, and those are pictured here in the darker purple, Lake Erie, Finger Lakes, Hudson River, and Long Island. And the light purple is a sort of secondary places that grapes are grown in New York. And I highlight this just to show you the side-by-side -side with the, the previous cold hardness map. And what you see is the dark purple areas here overlap with the dark green areas in the hardness map. And what that should be telling you is that we grow uh, grapes in New York right up to their climate hardiness limit, right onto the fringe. And that's about a 6A, 6B hardiness range. This is what the new hardiness map looks like now that we've adjusted for the last uh, decade, that we're warming quite a bit faster. You can see a much larger potential range for uh, grape production in the state. And this is primarily because winter's warming. And everyone I'm sure knows this here, it's beating a dead horse at this point. Winter's warming faster than summer. It's warming the fastest in the Northeast. Uh, the color variation on the big screen here is harder to see, but it's the most red up in the Northeast. We've warmed by about five degrees Fahrenheit since 1970. And that's the average winter temperature. And then down here in the bottom left is the minimum winter temperature across that same temp time range. So we've our coldest points in winter have also warmed on average six degrees Fahrenheit. What this warming tends to uh, interact with is the strength of the jet stream. So as the poles warm relative to the equator, it weakens the jet stream, which allows for more uh, chaotic breakouts of cold and warm weather. And this is exemplified by the polar vortex, as you can see in the bottom. Uh, so we're moving from a stable climate with deep midwinter cold to a chaotic climate with slightly less stress, but as I said, chaotic. It's really hard to... Uh, to see how the winter is progressing. All right, so that's the backdrop. So now let's talk about how cold hardiness uh, interacts with grapevines. And so pictured here on the right is a, an example year 
November through uh, April on the x-axis and temperature in, in Celsius on the y. And the red and the blue are the maximum temperatures through a given winter. And if we talk about cold hardiness, the most basic definition is the plant is able to survive all the minimum temperatures of the year. All right. And so that looks like this dashed U-shaped curve. We would say that this variety was sufficiently cold hardy for that winter and that the minimum temperatures never intersect with that dashed line. Cold hardiness can be broken into different parts. Acclimation is the active gaining of cold defense in early winter, and it's in response to a gradually decreasing temperatures. Maximum hardiness is a maintenance phase where the defense is maintained throughout winter. And then deacclimation is the rapid loss of that freeze hardiness as temperatures rise towards spring. Dormancy is the other component uh, that is critical to this whole process. And so it must you must be induced into endodormancy in the fall in order to acclimate. And you have to maintain dormancy through midwinter in order to maintain your hardiness. So at the beginning of winter, the buds are in a state of endodormancy where the physiology in the bud is being suppressed by internal metabolic control. And we don't know what is controlling that at this point. And what that looks like is if you go out to the field and you collect cuttings from the field and you put them in a greenhouse, so you remove them from a wintry condition, you put them in a greenhouse, they won't break bud. They hold on to that dormancy despite heat exposure. If you keep sampling through the whole winter, at some point, those buds transition from this growth arrested stage to a growth permissive stage. And when they're in the growth permissive stage, we call them ecodormant, where the temperatures outside are preventing growth. But if you were to have heat, they would grow. Okay, so these two different types of dormancy. This transition between the two types of dormancy is dependent on something called chilling accumulation. And it doesn't like my animation. Um, chilling accumulation is exposure to low but non-freezing temperatures. And there's lots of models for determining the amount of chill that occurs in a given year. But in this case, we're using every hour spent between 0 and 10 C counts as 1. And you add those up through the season. And that is our way of measuring this transition. And lots of crops have chilling hour requirements. And this is what it's referring to. The key point here is this transition between endodormancy and ecodormancy occurs as chilling accumulates. And so as you change winter temperature patterns, you can change the timing of the fulfillment of that transition. Okay. okay. Uh, so now we're gonna talk about how we measure cold hardiness. This is the uh, um, example of a dormant bud and grapevine. What I've done here is you've got a, I'm gonna stay in the zoom here. You've got a cane, you've got a bud on the surface and it's been cut and flipped open. And what you can see with the three different arrows is that it's a compound bud. The primary bud is at the center. And in this case, the primary bud is dead. You can see how it's necrotic. A secondary and a tertiary bud. The floral meristem that is important for every year's harvest and grape is primarily found in the primary bud. We measure uh, the failure of cold hardiness through something called differential thermal analysis. And it's measuring the freeze point, which in grapevine, the mechanism is called supercooling. I'm not going to get into the definition of that. Um, but because grapes supercool, we can measure the temperature that kills them. And the way we measure it is we excise buds. We collect the buds from the field. We excise them from the cane. We place them on these thermoelectric plates. Each one of these white squares is like a waffle with uh, two temperature sensing voltage and temperature sensing plates. And we put the buds on those, we put all the plates in a programmable freezer and then slowly freeze it down to negative 40. And when the water inside the primary bud freezes, that's the failure of cold hardiness, it releases a puff of heat and that puff of heat changes the voltage in the plate and we can record that as a spike, right? And so it's sort of like the last spike of uh, before it dies. And this is what the data looks like. And so pictured here, I'm not going to bother with that. I'll use this one. Pictured here on the left, uh, you see temperature decreasing, uh, voltage in the Y. And this big spike here is the high temperature exotherm. This is apoplastic water. And this is the water that freezes every night it goes below freezing. It does not kill the plant. As you, as you go colder and colder, you'll see that there's five tiny spikes there. Each one of those spikes is a primary bud that's freezing. And we call that the low temperature exotherm. We collect that data compute a mean that gives us a lethal temperature where 50% of the bud is killed or an LT50, okay? 
we uh, did some really cool stuff. I wanted to show you a couple of movies to shake up the lecture itself. Um, we did some really cool stuff to see what's actually going on when the LT happens. Uh, and we used the, the Cornell synchrotron facility. And basically what we do is we take high powered x-rays and we bounce them off a bunch of mirrors and then they hit the bud. And when they hit tissue different density, they bend. And you can see the bud based on the bending of the x-rays. And then we freeze it and we see what's happening as we freeze the bud. And so this is just, this is just for your pure enjoyment. Um, this is a three-dimensionally rebuilt scan of dormant grapevine buds. And I just want to let you watch this so you can see what the internal anatomy looks like because the next slide that we can't do the three-dimensionality on. So this is a bud. We're peeling back the layers. You can see the three different buds in that compound bud with the primary bud at the center. And if you look close, you can even see the little tiny inflorescences uh, packaged in that primary bud. In this movie, this is now a, side a sideways shot of that same type of bud. You have at the center here, the primary bud. You can't make it out because we can't reconstruct um, the freezing events. We can't use the same tech. So here's the primary bud. Oh, I'm sorry, you guys can't see that at all. Here's the primary bud and here's the secondary bud. This black line is a temperature probe needle. The red is the, the temperature of that probe and the blue is a similar probe in the air. And I chopped the video, so we're gonna jump straight to the important part. What you're gonna see at the freezing event is a big change in this temperature here relative to air. And this part of the bud, you're gonna see expand as the ice pushes through that tissue. And so that's gonna happen right around negative nine. And so there'll just be a little, little brief point here where it's uncomfortable to wait until it happens. Um, but watch closely on that right corner here and you'll see it expand outward. Hopefully everybody caught that. Um, the way this is set up, I can't slide the video back and forth to show you like a sped up version of it, but basically we're able to capture that freeze event or we're able to correlate that with the death of the, the tissue. And so we know when we show you these numbers, they're the actual death points. This is what that data looks like if you collect it across the year for two different cultivars. So here's two different winters. In the red line is the cultivar Cabernet Sauvignon. In the blue line is the cultivar La Crescent, which is a hybrid variety that's been bred for winter hardiness. And you can see in the two different years that you have that U-shaped curve for both varieties. Each little box plot is a different week of the winter where the, the data was collected. You can see that U-shape and you can see that the blue line is lower than the red line, right? So this is what the data looks like. We know from many years of experience that wild grapevines have more cold hardiness than hybrids who are, have more cold hardiness than vinifera. The pattern that you see amongst the different time points is driven by the pattern of cold events through winter. So when you, you tend to see a cold spike, you tend to see a little bit more acclimation. When you see a warm spike, you see a little bit of deacclimation. What you can't see from this very easy is that if you do this experiment in a cold year versus a warm year, the cold year will have a deeper U than the warm year. The grapevines do not reach a set maximum hardiness every year. They reach a maximum hardiness dependent on that year itself. So it's a very dynamic trait that moves. This is data for 32 different varieties. And instead of showing you the bulk numbers or showing the graphs, what I've done is I've summarized them by month, November through March in two different years. And I've color coded them. The weakest are red, the strongest are blue, okay? Um, you can break this up broadly into different categories. The least cold hardy tend to be the vinifera varieties. They have a hardiness range of about negative 16 to negative 21 Celsius. A middle ground where you have a mix of hybrids and vinifera, and then a very cold hardy group, which is almost exclusively hybrids. Uh, and they reach in this, in these two years, they reached a maximum negative cold hardiness of, uh, negative 28, basically. So what you can see here is that the rank order amongst, for this, I'm just showing you two years, we've done this for 15 years now, the rank order is mostly maintained from year to year. But you can see when you look across the different months that the relative cold hardiness between the cultivars varies. There's a lot of dynamics um, between the month that you're surveying the different cultivars. So there's a cultivar component, genetics are driving part of this, and there's a strong environmental component, environment is uh, driving it. And then the season to season variation you see is because of the interplay between those two pieces. And the best example is if you look in the um, cold hardy hybrids down on the bottom, 
you can see in the first year, it's blue all the way across. In the second year, it's blue all the way into the last month. And when they all turn red, what that's showing you is that those hybrids rapidly lost cold hardiness and now are less cold hardy than varieties that in midwinter were. So they switched positions, right? So the timing of when you survey this is really important. So that's the brief intro and understanding of cold hardiness. The other component I mentioned was the dormancy angle on this. And so when we are trying to figure out where they are in the dormancy cycle, I already alluded to this, you collect the material from the field and you watch how long it takes them to break bud. And if you chart the same two varieties in that experiment, that you get this curve linear response. And so in the very beginning of the winter, when you have very low chill, actually, this will help, we low chill, you don't get synchronous bud break. It takes you 100 to 150 days to break bud in the greenhouse. But as you accumulate chill, you get faster and more synchronous throughout the whole season. And that's showing you phenotypically the transition between those dormancy um, stages. The way we evaluate um, chilling requirement is kind of wacky. We just pick a we pick a days to bud break random number in grape that's 28 days. And so here you would say, how long does it take you to get synchronous bud break at 28 days? And that's your chilling hour requirement. If you do that with this data, you can see La Crescent reaches its chilling requirement much earlier in the winter than Cabernet Sauvignon. What I'm going to show you in the next couple of slides is our trying to rethink this whole process. So this is the historical way of assessing chilling hours. So we combine cold hardiness and um, bud break assays to try to understand the transition of dormancy. And the way, and this is um, work that my previous student, Al Kowalski, did. And I'm going to walk you through how we do it. So here's a winter, chilling is occurring. We go out to the field and we collect LT50 data, so cold hardiness data. But at this time point, we collect 100 buds. We survey 20 of them and then we put the rest in the greenhouse. And every couple of days, we survey their cold hardiness again and again to see how long they can hold on to their cold hardiness when exposed to heat. And what you see is in the beginning of winter, they hold on to that uh, cold hardiness for a very long time. They do not deacclimate. And so pictured here on the right is the actual data. So with 360 hours of chill, between zero and 90 days, this particular collection loses about 0 0.06 Celsius per day. So very, very resistant to that heat, very strong cold hardiness. If you go through the winter, you continue to accumulate chill. You run the experiment again. What you see is now the cold hardiness has increased and the chill has increased. So your point starts out lower, but when you deacclimate, your deacclimation rate is a lot higher. And so here it's 0.4 degrees C per day, seven times faster um, with 860 chill hours. So you do this again, just to finish out this graph, you do it again, you see that it goes up another seven times in its rate. So what we can use is we can use this cold hardiness assessment coupled with the greenhouse assessments to see how fast they lose their resistance to heat and we can use that as a proxy for the dormancy. And the really cool thing is if you line up these rates with bud break data, we see exactly what you would expect. The buds that are deacclimating very slow from early season have very high um, days to bud break. And then as your deacclimation rate gets faster, your bud break gets faster. So these phenotypes are related to one another. So again, let's look at our field data. Here's all winter long for Cab Sauv and La Crescent. If you do this experiment for Cabernet Sauvignon, each color here is a different week of the winter. Those lines are linear regressions for the deacclimation rate. And so you're seeing how across each week, the change in rate is occurring in the field. Well, actually, you see how it's occurring in the greenhouse from field collected material. And it's easier to see in La Crescent because the rates are so much higher in La Crescent. So the, the regression is a lot more obvious. And if you overlay these two, so now we take the fact that they have two different cold hardiness curves and we flatten their cold hardiness curves to zero and just overlay their rates, you can see that they have the same pattern. Very different maximum rates, but the exact same pattern. Little to no deacclimation in early winter, and it gradually gets faster and faster and faster as you go through the season. We did this on all 32 cultivars. It's not just the two that I've shown you in the talk. I'm not cheating. Uh, all of this diversity has the same response, all right? If you take these linear regressions and you plot them out, like I just showed you on the side-by-side, -side, and you fit that to a curve, you get this relationship among all the different varieties. So here, going from zero chilling 
to maximal chilling on the x-axis. And on the y is deacclimation rate per day, just simplified as it gets higher as you go up. You get this curvilinear response in all these different varieties. You can see here where lacrescent is faster than capsaw, which is what I showed you in the previous slide. And this is our ability to track the endodormancy to ecodormancy transition using deacclimation kinetics. Okay. Just to summarize their maximum hardiness by the end, or sorry, maximum deacclimation rate by the end of winter, a full chill. You can see our fastest variety is a hybrid Marechal Foch. It loses three degrees of Celsius of protection per day at 20 C. And our slowest is a different hybrid called Vignoles, which loses it at half that rate, 1.4. Okay, so there's a lot of variation in the response of these cultivars at the end of the winter to the same amount of heat. The other pattern I want to highlight is you'll notice that there's a cluster of hybrids at the very top that are very fast, then most of the vinifera in the middle, and then a small cluster of hybrids towards the bottom. And not really enough sampling to say it's more than a casual observation that you have these two hybrid groups and then a vinifera group. But as a sideline, the vinifera or the hybrid group that's at the top all tend to come from Vitus riparia, which is a northern species that gets used a lot for cold hardiness breeding. The little group at the bottom pulls from a different wild grapevine gene pool. And so what we think we're seeing here is separation of adaptive traits based on the pedigrees that these hybrids are coming from. <clears throat> to, to see if you can stick with me for one more complication, if you take this curve, you see they have different maximum rates, right? If you normalize these rates, so you take their maximum rate and you set that to 100%, you can then compare the shape of these curves across the winter, across the different phenotype, right? And that's what this looks like. You basically take your variation and you normalize it to 100%, and it collapses that variation down into the same shaped curve. So what this is telling us is that all of these different varieties are essentially following the same physiological transition through winter, even though their phenotype at the end of winter diverges. Here, if you take sort of the 50% point, it's the inflection in the curve, and use that as a marker, um, we can look at deacclimation is very low to the left of that inflection point, and it gets higher as you go to the right, okay? Ob you can observe it in the field as it goes to the right, basically. This inflection point in New York happens around 950 hours of chill, which happens usually on January 1st. Somewhere from December 15th to January 15th, it varies. But that's the marker in our winters when you go from safe heat in the early winter where the deacclimation response is suppressed to dangerous heat where it, the um, vines are now primed for growth. So we can use this now to model how our winters are changing to see whether or not our varieties are at elevated risk of early bud break. Or at least that's the concept. So just to synthesize that. We talked about cold hardiness varies by genetics. It varies between the two gene tools that we use um, in great production hybrids and vinifera. And in this case, lacrescent is more cold hardy than Cabernet Sauvignon, always more cold hardy. We also talked about bud break. So in the spring, at the end of winter, we also have a divergence in phenotype in that lacrescent always reaches that synchronicity faster than Cabernet Sauvignon. And we also talked about how deacclimation rate is different by genetics and that Cab Cabernet Sauvignon is always a slower deacclimator than La Crescent. Although they transition dormancy in the same way, the phenotype is slower. So if you put these three things together, you ask the question, if we take the cold hardiness at every week in the winter and we divide it by its deacclimation rate, can we get to its bud break phenology? Can we just use these different parts of physiology to predict bud break. And it turns out that it works really well. And so here are the relationships between um, LTE, DIAC, and bud break phenology for the two different varieties. It is not exactly one-to-one, -one. it's not 100% prediction, but the, the relationship of those three phenotypes together is very good. And so we're able to use this now to work on building prediction models based on the biology of these vines instead of um, the climate itself. We use the climate, but not based on the climate. So we've used this approach to doing these deep dives on these different varieties to build a couple of different 
cold hardiness models. I'm not going to go into depth on the models because I just want you to know what we use this data for. These models get you um, put up on a website for growers to go and look at so they can assess whether or not their vines are at risk of freeze in the field. We've done two different models. We've taken an empirical approach using the data I just described. We've also used a machine learning approach. In both cases, the model fits very well, uh, particularly for the Northeast. Um, and it, it's weird. We published both models in the same year, but that's because we had very divergent interests and they just happened to get published together. Um, what I wanted to highlight here is that we use the Kovaleski model here is from Al Kovaleski's work, that empirical data, what we can now use is to test whether or not we can build bud break models. Pictured here is the average bud break in the Concord Belt in Western New York. It's the only phenological database that we have with this kind of depth of inf information going all the way back to 1978. We can see that bud break is getting uh, earlier in the season, about four days in uh, the Concord Belt. If you move inland, it's actually getting faster, faster, uh, because Lake Erie is a, a microclimate buffer. So it tends to mute climate change. But we can see it even there that it's getting faster. If you plot the growing degree days needed, so here's growing degree days in the Y and the observed Julian day of bud break. If you use growing degree days to try to predict bud break, you can see that there is up to 90 growing degree day variation in trying to figure out when buds break. Growing degree days don't work very well for bud break. But if you use those deacclimation kinetics to do it, this is the relationship you get. Almost perfectly one-to-one -one using field data. And so this is this is an example of how close our data points come year to year, the observed bud break versus the deacclimation predicted bud break and across the whole series. And we narrowed the error rate and prediction from down around 30 days to down to five days. So it's really cool. Um, and the, the whole point of this is just to say that when we understand the biology of the vine and how it's actually re reacting to the climate, rather than just using historical observation, we can really figure out how to tune uh, and so there's a prediction model in process that will be out for great, hopefully in the next year. Um, and this is part of the, the work, hopefully, that we're helping out with Courtney's stuff is how can we take these models and transmit them into other uh, fruit crops? So here, the take home point from this is that when you use the biology, it's better than just using historical observations and patterns because it allows you to tune. Okay. So to summarize that portion, cold hardiness changes every year based on the temperature pattern. The response to chilling seems to be conserved within grapevine. The phenotypes are variable, but the actual physiological transition seems to be very conserved among the, the different genetic backgrounds. Chilling accumulation, uh, it's generally accumulates linearly through the winter, but it changes based on the winter severity, right? So the chilling, the maximum chilling point can, or I mean the inversion chilling point can shift between early and late winter. And it's important to know when that shift is because then we can predict whether or not uh, deacclimation risk is increasing. We can use those two factors together to predict bud break. The accuracy of those predictions are, of course, related to weather prediction and, and how well it ties to historical averages. So lots of work we've done so far, but we're untangling this. And now what I want to shift to for the later portion here is to sort of try to dial in now to try to figure out what's going on during deacclimation. Hopefully I've convinced you that deacclimation is the most interesting part of this whole phenomenon. So we've been trying to figure out what happens during deacclimation because ultimately I want to produce tools that the growers might be able to use in order to combat climate change. So I'm going to shift now from field physiology and sort of the description of what we've been doing more into transcriptomics and then back out to the field. So what I want to show you here is a, a brief synopsis of a study we did looking at the transcriptomics of eco-dormancy release, which is a fancy way of saying we did gene expression analysis during deacclimation just to see what the processes were. And so we used four different genotypes. Uh, Vitus amurensis and Vitus riparia are two um, wild grapevine species from the north. Uh, amurensis is from China, riparia is from in this case, it was from Canada, Riesling, and then Cabernet Sauvignon. And the best way to remember this is that they're color-coded like a rainbow from fast to slow, right? So red, yellow, green, purple is decreasing in speed for their deacclimation response. We sampled them all in late winter. We took buds. 
uh, cuttings and put them in a greenhouse. And then every day we collected tissue for RNA-seq analysis until they broke bud, physically broke bud in the greenhouse. And then we overlaid that experiment to look at what does a fast variety do versus a slow variety. I'm sure you've all seen heat maps of transcriptomics. The only point here is to show you that we have, in general, a couple um, really big modules of genes that are upregulated as buds are getting close to bud break and a bunch of genes that are downregulated. And this makes sense because we're going from a very dormant physiology to a full growth physiology. It's what you'd expect. Um, we did time series weighted analysis. We saw around eight to 9,000 genes are differentially expressed across this time series and across our different varieties. That's about 20% of the genes in grapevine. So there's a good amount of the uh, metabolic physiology that's being uh, either upregulated or downregulated. There are 43 significant pathways. We're not gonna go through 43 pathways. They hit the things that you would expect related to growth, hormones, metabolism, and circadian rhythm. I want to dial in on one or like a few very specific pathways. But to orient, orient you in case you haven't seen gene expression data before. So here's an example. Time and days on the x-axis, relative expression on the y. And here you can see that this particular gene in all four varieties, we collect it from the field. It has high gene expression. Within the first day, the gene expression drops very quickly and it follows that tailed pattern throughout the whole experiment. It's being This gene is being shut down. This gene, uh, and here's a little legend just to help reorient you, in purple, the gene is ZEP, and it converts zeaxanthin into violaxanthin as part of the initial steps, <laughs> initial steps in producing the hormone ABA, okay? And so in this case, you can see this downregulation would be reducing the production of violaxanthin. This is the whole pathway. We're going to step through it a little bit at a time. So we see the first gene here is shut off. We see the next gene, NSAID, which is the committing step to making ABA, is also shut off. And what this tells us is that ABA is not being made endogenously during deacclimation. If we continue along the pathway, we see that its conversion to phasic acid is being shut down and the ABA signaling pathway is being shut down. And so this is telling us that the plant says, temperature is here. I'm ecodormant. I'm waking up. Don't make ABA, stop ABA signaling. If we look at this other side of the, um, if we look at this other side of the signaling, you can see that this is ABA storage right here. And it's, so it's being moved out of storage into active ABA, but because it's being shut down, what we think that means is that it's being purged. It's being taken out of storage, but getting gotten rid of. And if you look here, the, this portion of the ABA signaling pathway, which leads to seed germination in Arabidopsis, this is upregulating. And so what we're seeing here is ABA is being purged from the system and shutting down signaling. And the things that would normally be associated with seed growth are being upregulated. That makes sense. When we look at the cytokine and cell cycle, we see the same makes sense profile. So here is tubulin and kinesin and myosin. So all in, important in new cells, they're all being turned on. You see that in the cytokine pathway, the cytokinin response is being shut down. Repressors of that are being turned on. So this makes sense. It's shutting down cytokinin. And if you shut down the cytokinin response, you release this rep repression on the cell cycle. Okay, so it makes sense. We get rid of ABA, we allow cells to divide, it's getting towards growth. And the other really cool thing here is um, the uh, personal hobby here is aquaporins. And so there are a couple different aquaporins and grape aquaporins are important for pores for water to move between membranes. And here you see that there's two aquaporins that are downregulated and two aquaporins that are upregulated. Uh, but if you look at the signaling pathway that triggers these, the ABA triggered aquaporins are downregulated and the independent ones are upregulated. So here you're seeing a differentiation in the cells, again, between ABA signaling and growth resumption. That's probably more than you wanted to know, but it's important because the, the hypothesis then is if we supply ABA to the system, we should be able to block the, the deacclimation. And that's what this experiment is showing here. So in the top A panel here is bud break and the bottom is cold hardiness. And we'll start with the cold hardiness. This looks just like those deacclimation experiments I was showing you. In control is green and in pink and purple are ABA treated buds. And you can see that you apply the ABA and you stop the deacclimation. 
of those buds. They, you enhance their cold hardiness. If you follow that out to bud break, you see that the end result of that is that we delay bud break in the ABA treated uh, canes. And this it's just a eight, it's just a one plus one is equal to kind of relationship, right? We just shift um, the signaling of that pathway back. When we spray it on the field, you can see the field manifestation of that difference as well. So if you apply ABA in the field, you can um, block phenology at least temporarily. So ABA really seems like a great way to modify phenology. And, it, you know, as just a quick primer, it, it does a lot of things associated with dormancy and cold hardiness, including delaying bud break. But the big, big problem is ABA breaks down really rapidly in the field if you spray it on. It's UV sensitive. It's hard to get into bud tissues because bud tissues are specifically patterned to keep things out, right? So it doesn't work very well when we apply it in the field using native ABA. And this is um, work that my other student, Hongrei uh, Wang, was working on. So we have coupled with a um, Canadian company that has developed a synthetic ABA. And you can see here, uh, what we've done is we just added an extra ring. I haven't done this. The, the folks in Canada have added an extra ring. And this molecule to the plant looks like ABA and signals like ABA, but it doesn't break down. And so it degrades. Well, it does break down, but at a very slow rate. So this product we actually apply in the fall. And so here's Hungary spraying it on some uh, grapevines in the fall. What we did is called Tetralone. We sprayed it on relative to a water control. We sprayed it on three different varieties, Riesling and Cayuga White, and then Aravel, which is the progeny of these two, sort of as a mini pedigree. And we wanted to ask the question, if we spray this ABA, Tetralone ABA on there, can we affect cold hardiness, dormancy, and phenology? And the first result is looking at senescence in the field. And so here is a comparison at one week of between control and tetralone. And hopefully you can see that there's a color difference there. And that color difference is really exaggerated at two weeks. And by three weeks, you can see the senescence color is the same, but there's no leaves here on the tetralone. So we've enhanced senescence quite a bit with this fall application. And if we measure the chlorophyll um, shutdown rate of those different applications on different varieties, you can see that there's a huge impact of tetralone here in A or in blue, um, where we reduce chlorophyll really rapidly in the field. And that reduction difference varies by genotype, right? If we look at the cold hardiness now of those treated uh, different varieties, here's Riesling, Aravel, and Cayuga White in two different years, tetralone in blue, control in red. This is that same LTE data we were looking at before. And if we Focus in on the acclimation phase. These little asterisks show you that it's a significant deviation from control. And what you can see is that we're basically shutting down the vines earlier in the season and they're acclimating earlier. So they have enhanced cold hardiness in the beginning of the season. A little bit less of a response here in Aravel and almost no response in Cayuga White. So it works in viniferas, but maybe not in hybrids. And then when we look at the deacclimation, we see an effect in all three genotypes. It slows deacclimation in the field uh, in both years. So in essence, it looks like you enhance cold hardiness, but really what you're doing is you're just uh, decreasing deacclimation. Okay, so we did one other control experiment on this concept. So this is field collected data. If you collect the data and do it under forcing conditions, much like the deacclimation assays I showed you before, you collect in the beginning, early part of winter, and you compare tetralone deacclimation rate relative to control deacclimation rate. You see in early winter, they deacclimate at the same rate, right? So we're not affecting early winter uh, deacclimation rate. But as you go through midwinter into late winter and you fulfill your chilling, you decrease deacclimation rate by around 25%, right? So the ABA application works in the field and we can replicate that phenotype under growing conditions. So if this all connects, and what I told you is true in the first part, if you slow down deacclimation, you should be able to change flowering for, or bud break phenology. And you can, right? So if you then go and look at bud break phenology in the field, this scale here is something called the EL scale. The numbers correspond to different stages. And so here we've marked stage four. That's what the bud looks like in the field. We consider that bud break. 
and up to stage 12, which is the chute is exposed here. So that's this other dashed line. <clears throat> so when you look at Riesling, Aravel, and Cayuga White, you can see the progression of phenology has been shifted in all three. And if you compute the actual shift here at that uh, stage, stage four, it's delayed 11 days in Riesling, nine and eight across the other two varieties. So it all fits together, right? We understand that ABA going in plays an important role. It suppresses deacclimation and it alters phenology. <clears throat> so ABA plays a role in endodormancy induction and adding supplemental, supplemental ABA can enhance cold acclimation. But you can't necessarily speed something up that's already going fast. As I showed you, the acclimation didn't work in Cayuga White. It shuts itself down early, and it's really hard to make that happen even faster. But for slow acclimating varieties, ABA can enhance that. Um, it also enhances deacclimation resistance. And the reason we think it's doing that is just because it is maintaining a signaling presence in the dormant bud. Normal ABA gets purged. Synthetic ABA overrides that ability, and so we can suppress the phenotype. <clears throat> Enhanced deacclimation resistance causes a change in phenology. What I didn't show you is it doesn't affect the other phenological stages. Flowering is the fine. Heartfist is fine. It doesn't change cluster number or anything. The synthetic ABA does eventually get purged from the system, so it is sort of in the sweet spot of its changing one specific phenology and not causing downstream effects. <clears throat> This also indicates us, to us some potential breeding targets in grapevine breeding. So if we start breeding for enhanced ABA sensitivity, that provides cultivars that are more amenable to mitigation events, or cultivars that have reduced ABA turnover should also have delayed um, bud break. So those are some of the work we're trying to collaborate now with the grapevine breeder to identify the markers that might be associated with those traits. And you made it through. So this is the summary slide. Um, what we've talked about today is the interplay of cold hardiness, chilling, and deacclimation, and how it reflects differences in the physiological tuning of the different varieties. And so pictured again here on the right is a side-by-side -side of the cold hardiness comparisons and the deacclimation risk comparisons. And what you'll notice if you look just quickly is that all of the varieties, for the most part, that are cold sensitive, they're red, tend to have slower deacclimation, whereas the hybrids that have been bred to be cold hardy, also carry along fast deacclimation. And so we have a little bit of trait hitchhiking where we've selected for enhanced midwinter hardiness, but inadvertently created varieties that have low frost resistance because they break bud so early. So now we have to rethink those breeding efforts to include these two traits as two separate goals. We mentioned that climate change is changing the stability of winters. And what that has an effect on is all of these traits all at the same time. It reduces maximum cold hardiness. It changes chill accumulation patterns. And those two things together changes bud break phenology. And so as we go forward with the understanding of the different biological and climate parts, we can do a better job of predicting how our varieties are going to be suitable now in 30 years. We talked about deacclimation response, showing a conserved response across the different genotypes. Um, this is still very contra that. That claim is still very controversial. People don't like the idea of rewriting the idea of chill hours. We're working on it. Um, the fact that it's conserved in grape uh, is really interesting because if you then use grape as a model and test other systems, we find that the same pattern, the same S-shaped pattern of chill accumulation occurs in peaches, cherries, red bud, dogwood, pine trees, sugar maple, a whole swath of woody species uses this dormancy progression including hopefully blueberry. Uh, and then finally, we talked about how ABA plays a really key role in all of these phenotypes and that we're, we're working to try to get a better mechanistic understanding of that whole framework and then create breeding targets that we can exploit to make the crops more resilient. And that's it. I just wanted to say thank you. Um, some funding agency information here. A lot of vineyard collaborations uh, make this, this work. Uh, doable. And my contact information at the top there, if you're still on Twitter, you can message me on Twitter. Um, I mostly am just a, a stalker there now. I don't interact too much. It's a little too toxic, but you can still find me there. And then uh, my Cornell email address, and I'm always happy to uh, explain things better or, you know, 
go off on new brainstorming. So, and then thank you for your attention. Anybody have questions? I'm just trying to see if there's anything on here either. Oh, there is one on here too. But I might've screwed up the, can I go backwards so that it's not so dark in here? There, okay. Someone's hand, yeah. That was such an awesome talk. So I had a question when you're end when you're entering dormant or when plants are entering dormancy, for especially cold hardy plants, is it an all or nothing process or does the drop to minus 30 C have some physiological difference than a drop to minus 40 C? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question was, uh, as you're entering cold hardiness, is there a difference in the physiology depending on the the relative drop to level defense, right? So is there a difference in physiology between gaining to negative 20 hardiness versus negative 30 hardiness? And that's a, that's a great question I don't have the answer for. Um, we do know that in order to gain that freeze hardiness, you have to be dormant. So green tissues can't do this. Um, experiments I didn't show here. When you When a bud is exposed to decreasing temperatures, it is important that there's a temperature oscillation included in that ramp. So if we've done experiments where if you put uh, dormant buds at 2C or at 15C and you just hold them there, they don't change their cold hardiness at all, which you would expect the 2C would make it gain cold hardiness because it's more of a cold stress. But it turns out the static temperature can't work on its own. It's not sufficient. If you, though, oscillate the temperature around that mean, uh, so plus or minus five, both of those will gain cold hardiness. And so there's some, there is some sort of perception aspect that requires there to be a temperature fluctuation for you to gain that increased resistance. Unfortunately, we don't know enough about how that acclimation occurs to know what trigger is sort of being pushed. And it's, I've griped about this with a couple of folks that I've spoken here. A lot of this, because the process takes over such a long period of time, it's really hard to detect significant shifts between any two time points, right? Because it's very gradual. But it's very clear that a daily temperature oscillation with a mean that's decreasing gives you your most uh, strongly driving trigger for acclimation. It does appear that the higher the amplitude is also better, but that experiment, the experiment we did is not, a, is not publication ready. Um, it's just more of an anecdotal observation. So the key thing is that you need oscillating temperatures that are decreasing. The carry on to that is if you have warm temperatures, if you have the growing season pushing further into winter and you interrupt that, you don't prevent dormancy, but you prevent strong acclimation. If you prevent strong acclimation, you minimize maximal hardiness. If you think about like you have to get the accelerator down as far as you need it to get the deepest cold hardiness. So the way that plants suffer from a lower, longer growing season is you mute that ability to, to drop down as deep as they could. And then you're, once you're there, you're kind of set. By midwinter, you can't, there's not a lot of physiology that can happen when temperatures are consistently below freezing. There's just not enough metabolism. Okay. I'm does like, that answer it? Yeah. I'm okay. Like going off that, does that mean that a plant that's exposed to like a warm winter might not be so ready for a next cold winter? It's not so important winter to winter because the buds, well, in this particular case, because we prune off all the buds in Right for in in prepping the vineyard for the the next year, we end up pruning off most of the buds, and so the new buds that go into the second winter never experience the first winter. So there's no evidence of a carryover. Um, similarly, trees that don't get pruned, the growing tips change, right, and they pattern new buds. So whether or not a history of winter uh, has an effect, you would have to. It would be a tricky experiment, right, because you'd have to progressively follow buds backwards in development over several seasons. And as soon as you prune it to, to assess it, you've basically terminated the rest of that experiment. So conceptually, it's a very interesting idea. And it, technically, I think it's a very tricky thing to tease out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, Mind-blowing, okay? <laughs> so uh, from the pr uh, practical perspective, uh, when you apply the uh, the analog of ABA to play, you know, kind of uh, 
uh, slow down the acclimation. Yes. Um, and in you, you got a few days out of it, right? So what is it like eleven days, or yep. is that enough to actually, you know, ensure that they don't freeze again or something like that when they yeah. start? Or do you need actually more, or do you need more control? Uh, in terms of the length of that, it could it could be delayed by. Uh, that's first part, and second part, uh, considering that you know. We are getting kind of warmer environments in some parts. Mm -hmm. um, would that impact, you know, in future what we find out today or? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the question was, with the tetralone, do we get enough of an effect to matter, um, given that the delay is less than two weeks in, in this experiment anyway? And then does the rising winter temperatures does that somehow get in the way of that effectiveness as well, right? And so uh, the amount of delay that you need is one day more than the frost. So it's going to, because you just need to, you just need to keep your buds dormant to dodge that last frost. So the answer to that is very seasonal dependent, right? So if you have, like last spring, for example, we had a freeze on May 18th and the, the buds had pushed about eight inches nothing's going to delay you that long, right? That freeze, there's no preventing it with ABA. The freeze that you're trying to prevent is the one that comes closest to your predicted bud break, right? So within two weeks, for example, you, in grape, you can delay other things. You can let the vines, um, don't prune the vines and the apical buds will break. And the apical buds, when they break, they suppress the basal buds. And so you can frost those off, prune everything, and then you grow your vine. So you can manage frost risk in other ways that affects vine quality but the whole key is just can you get past that last one and that you cannot answer that in a given year um maybe there's a timing thing where we could expand that window right so we did a fall application maybe you could do a fall application and a follow-up spring and that would really give you a buffer uh, we haven't tried that but depending on the spring it will have a greater or lesser uh, capacity to dodge. Now, will warmer winters reduce that is an excellent question. One thing we see, I didn't show the gene expression we did with the uh, tetralone. When we put these buds in 20C and we deacclimate them and we look at the gene expression, we see a delay in all the gene expression like you would hope, but we see that that delay is basically good for about five days. So five days at 20C and that tetralone has been purged just through simple metabolic turnover. So even though it's much more persistent than native ABA, that delay at the transcriptional layer only makes it about five days. So if you warm up the whole winter, presumably you warm up the, the turnover rate, you reduce the ability of that to create a meaningful delay. So I can't really answer it, but that's the, it has the potential to be a really good product. It definitely needs to be optimized. And it's not clear whether or not warmer winters will sort of nullify. I don't think it'll nullify the whole effect, but does it nullify it in some years? It might. Growers don't like inconsistency either, right? They want to know it's a 10 days, yes. Not a sometimes six days, sometimes 14 days. Oops, not this winter, you know. But that's the, that's the reality of it. When you're dealing with a plant interacting with the environment, we cannot predict climate accurately far enough out. We cannot, we can't give hard numbers, unfortunately. All right, well, I know we probably all have more questions, but um, in the interest of time, uh, I want to say thank you again to Jason for an excellent talk. Thank you. Okay.